Trainees are some of the most popular characters in Fire Emblem, and it's not difficult to see why. The Zero to Hero training arc is a very appealing one, as it lets you see your progress throughout the course of the game. A character who deletes entire armies on enemy phase is more rewarding if you remember struggling to get there when they dealt only 2 damage and got one shot in retaliation. From a design perspective, it can also be humorous to see characters who are designed as weak, such as children or farmers, turn into absolute gods, slaughtering everything in their path. And on a base level, it's just satisfying to hear ding 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 every time you level up. However, despite their popularity, trainees tend to be on the lower end of the viability tier lists in most cases, and the few exceptions where they end up being strong units typically don't feel like a trainee in the traditional sense. So I thought it might be interesting to take a look at the history of trainee units throughout the series, talk about what works, what doesn't, and what lessons Fire Emblem could potentially take going forward if they're going to continue including villagers slash trainee units in future titles. With that in mind, I think I should describe what I consider to be a trainee unit. A trainee is someone who joins typically within the first third of the game, with lower stats than everyone around them, but the promise of higher growths. In some games, they start in a tier 0 class, giving them more flexibility of what directions they want to go, but in other games they are simply a low level in a tier 1 class. Note that for the purposes of this video, there are two groups of units who are very similar to trainees, but I personally do not consider to be trainees. The first is Ests. Ests are also low base, high growth units, or at least they pretend to be in some cases. However, I consider them to be different than trainee or villager units because they join near the end of the game. So rather than being a project over the entire course of the game, their appeal is that they are very low level for the time and will gain experience faster. However, the downside is that they are now facing stronger enemies than if they had joined at the very beginning of the game. To be honest, I don't think that Ests are especially good either, and a lot of the flaws that they have do overlap with the flaws of trainee units, but that is outside of the scope of this video. If you are interested in seeing more about Ests in Fire Emblem, there is a companion piece to this video that was released by my good friend Akira at the same time, and it will be linked in the description below as well as the end card. The other group that I do not consider to be trainee units are the villagers that join an alms side in Fire Emblem Gaiden and Shadows of Valentia. While they do all start as low level tier 0 units with an emphasis on customizability and growths, you only have two non-villager units at that point, Alm and Lucas, and even those two are not that much higher level than the villagers that join on alms side. As a result, I would not consider them to be trainees since they are the core of your army. One of the things that makes a trainee a trainee is that they start out weaker than everyone around them, and that's not the case if everyone is a trainee. On the other hand, I consider the sole villager on Celica's side, Atlas, to be a trainee unit, as he joins at the beginning of Act 3, at the time when everyone around him should be a Tier 1 or Tier 2 unit, whereas he is a Tier 0 unit. So with that in mind, let's talk about Atlas. Now, Gaiden and Shadows of Valentia are not games where it is especially worthwhile to be a growths unit. After all, the way that the promotion system works tends to bring everyone to around the same statistical level, as lower statted people just get raised to class bases the same way that higher statted people do. As such, in many ways, the most important features of a unit are their level and their class line. There are obviously some exceptions, resistance comes to mind as something that is never going to get raised by class bases, and growths are not entirely irrelevant, but they're not as big a deal as they are in other games, and I already think they're not a huge deal in a lot of other games. That being said, Atlas doesn't actually have especially good growths. In fact, most of his growths are below average for the units on Celica side. The only one that is especially noteworthy is the 50% attack growth, but even this is, well, good, not the sort of thing that you would expect from a trainee unit. As such, the biggest thing that Atlas has to offer is flexibility. Since he's the only villager in Celica's army, he's the only one you can choose what class path they want to go on without using the Pitchfork DLC. This is definitely nice, and you can use specific class lines to patch up his weaker stats by focusing on something that has good speed or defense, but at the end of the day, he's not going to give you the ding 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 of getting a bunch of stats in level ups. 
which means while he's not the worst unit out there, he fails to sort of capture that trainee essence, to the point where it almost feels like a stretch putting him on there. The only reason I still consider him to be a trainee is because he starts out in a much lower class, but I would totally understand if others don't consider him to be because gameplay-wise he doesn't feel like one. You could make the argument that getting him to promotion gives him a bunch of stat gains and that fulfills the trainee quota, but he starts already ready for promotion, so the only thing you really need to do to complete that training arc is send him to a shrine and then choose what class you want to send him into. So it really doesn't feel like the payoff for a zero to hero arc, instead you just skip all of that and get the payoff instead. But if we want to look at a unit who gets a major payoff simply from promotion games, look no further than Fire Emblem 4. While they are not often brought up when discussing trainee units, I do think that Ratchesis and Leaf definitely apply to this archetype. They join early enough in their respective generations to be considered relatively early game units, and they pale in comparison to everyone around them. Not only because their stats are not especially strong, but because they are unmounted units in Genealogy of the Holy War, aka Genealogy of the Horsey War. Growths in genealogy are very nuts across the board, so the fact that Leaf and Lachesis have pretty good growths isn't what makes them outstanding. Instead, it is their promotion. Specifically, the promotion to Master Knight, which is considered by most Fire Emblem people to be the best promotion gains and probably the best class in all of Fire Emblem. They go from being footlocked scrubs to hardened horse riders, and not only that, they get a huge snap gain in almost every area as well as gaining access to a bunch of new weapon types. Axes are pretty redundant, but lances allow for physical 1-2 range, magic is nice because you can hit on resistance, staves are really great because they become the only mounted A-rank staffers in the game, and bows can be good for shooting down flyers occasionally. You're still probably going to use swords and magic for most of your combat, but all of these options is definitely nice to have, and feels good to see that they get a bunch of ranks they didn't have before. I think this is probably the best example of a trainee payoff done well in all of Fire Emblem, as both of the promotions are very relevant for the generations that they're in. Ratchesis is able to promote around the time that Ethlyn is probably going to leave, and if that's the case, she will be your only mounted staffer for quite some time. Technically, Eren can also get staves on promotion, but since she is flying instead of footlocked and limited to C-rank staffs, it is definitely worse. A mounted Ratchesis also makes the conversation with Eldigan much easier to accomplish, which is good because he's a tough boss to fight, and also you get the Earth Sword out of it, which you can sell for a lot of money, or use if you want to throw away a lot of money. Now, because Ratchesis has access to unpromoted staffs, you can definitely cheese her training arc by spamming the return staff if you want, but the same cannot be said of Leaf, who requires combat for all of his first 20 levels before he can become a Master Knight. This is definitely worth doing because Master Knight is a good class, and also because you potentially have access to the Rescue Staff, and he's the only mounted unit who can use it, meaning that if you want to use it to its fullest capability to travel across the really large maps, you want it on Leaf. Training Leaf is not the most difficult task in the world, but it is something that requires an amount of forethought, whether that is on the battlefield, by setting up kills for him, or during the metagame planning aspect of things by sending him items in inheritance that will really help the training up, such as the Pursuit Ring or the Paragon Ring. Your reward for doing this is something wholly unique to Leaf. As mentioned before, he is the only mounted unit who can use the Rescue Staff in Generation 2, and that's a big deal. Maps are really big, so even if you don't care about LTCing, it stops the tedium of moving units every single turn and can potentially get you out of tough spots or help an infantry unit to keep up with the rest of your squad. I like this approach to the trainee payoff because it means that their role cannot simply be replicated by someone else done a little bit worse in exchange for not having to go through the training arc. And that brings us pretty cleanly to the GBA era trainees. The first of which is Lalina. She joins at level 1 in Chapter 8, and her stats don't especially impress on first glance. In particular, that 16 HP is really pathetic. She's going to get one shot by almost every enemy. However, that's pretty standard fare for a GBA mage, so let's try not to hold it against her too much. 
Since she joins near the end of the Chapter 8 map, it's hard to raise her on that map itself, but it's not a huge deal because 8x and 9 are both maps that are generally considered to be breather maps and pretty good for training the slew of new units that you get during the 7, 8, 9 stretch. And of these new units, Lolina is definitely the most competent. She is the second unit you have capable of hitting on resistance, and has a massive 75% magic growth. The rest of her growths are pretty standard fare, so we have another Atlas situation on our hands, where the question is just how good is a massive attack stat. And in Lelina's case, I think she makes a better argument than Atlas. After all, hitting on resistance is quite nice, and at this time your only other option is Banana Boy, who is also a pretty good unit, but aren't two mages better than one? Lelina also has a very fast support with Roy, in fact she gets the C support within one turn, and this helps boost her already good attack stat and make up for her somewhat lacking skill stat. I don't think she's some sort of ubermensch, but I do think she is a little bit overlooked as a growths unit who has a good payoff especially in comparison to the other growths units who join in the same chapter as her, who I hesitate to even call growths units or trainees. Wendy and Ogier join in chapter 8 as well, and they also start at low level, but their growths are painfully average. Ogier and Deke have basically the same growths, and Deke joined six chapters earlier and is at the point in time where he's kind of sundowning anyway. Wendy, on the other hand, is an armor knight, the worst class in the game, with no path out of it, and isn't even bulky. The two of them feel much closer to joke units than trainees, so their inclusion is mostly just for the sake of completeness. I do not think that this is a good approach to trainee, in case it wasn't obvious. If you are investing in a weaker unit, you should not be training them to end up with a unit who is still weaker than the competition. And that brings us pretty smoothly to FE8. But I'm not talking about Amelia, as you might suspect. No, Ross is the victim of this smear piece. Now, friend of the channel, Actual Lizard, made an entire video on Ross that I would highly recommend checking out if you haven't already. But the long and the short of it is that training Ross gets you a worse version of either his father or Dazla, depending on which promotion path you choose to go down. Neither Dazla nor Garcia are considered to be top tier units in Sacred Stones, so a unit who you have to train in order to get to that point and then ends up being a worse version of them anyway is not an appealing prospect. Many will defend Ross by pointing out that his training arc is not actually that difficult, and I agree, Sacred Stones is an easy game, and there are multiple maps where there are enemies that Ross can pretty easily kill. In particular, Chapter 4, the first monster map, has a bunch of easy-to-kill enemies that you can use to funnel experience into whichever project you want. However, just because Ross is easy to train doesn't make him a good unit. There are a lot of other people in Sacred Stones who are pretty easy to train using those same maps, and in fact, they are kind of competing over experience with Ross, as there are only so many monsters to kill unless you're willing to go into the Tower of Valmy. In particular, Vanessa and Artur really appreciate getting trained on Erica route, and Franz is a pretty good candidate if you're going Ephraim route. But even if you don't plan on using those specific units, someone else, like Gilliam, Garcia, or Loot, would also appreciate the experience. In general, I think Ross is a pretty good example of why an easy training arc doesn't necessarily make for a good trainee. After all, the only payoff is combat, and if other people outclass his combat, then what is the point of training him? And now that I've mentioned the only payoff to Ross being his combat, I have approximately 200 comments about what about the Chapter 7 Riverwalk? You forgot about the Chapter 7 Riverwalk. Yo, Ross saves some turns with the Chapter 7 Riverwalk. So, I do feel the need to address the Riverwalk, because this is brought up extremely often when talking about Ross. Firstly, the Chapter 7 Riverwalk is not especially applicable to standard play. Unless you care about getting the absolute minimum turn count, you can very easily pick up the unit you want to drop on turn 1, and then drop them on turn 2 on the other side of the river. Vanessa can do this on her own, and she doesn't need Ross's help. There's no actual time pressure on that map, so the only reason that we are trying to go faster is because we've challenged ourselves to do so. Second off, Ross doesn't actually save turns in the instance where he participates in the Riverwalk Rescue Drop. Ross's sole purpose is a reliability thing. It is very easy to three-turn that chapter with just Vanessa, you simply have to rig some dodges against bows and also a 7% crit with Erica's rapier. 
this is incredibly unreliable, but it is something that can be done, and so it's not technically a turn save, quote unquote. But thirdly, even within a reliability-dependent LTC context, ROS is generally considered to be a D-tier unit. He's just not doing too much for the playthrough. You train him a bunch for a single rescue drop and then bench him immediately. The Riverwalk is definitely neat trivia, but at the end of the day, it just does not add a bunch to his worth as a unit. But speaking of units that don't have much worth to them, Amelia is just barely in the first third of Sacred Stones, but she is sort of the quintessential trainee, so I'll talk about her. Being able to go Cavalier and then Paladin is definitely a boon, but it's not enough to make up for Amelia's horrendous bases and pretty poor growths. On average, a 10-1 Paladin Amelia has just a few points in most stats over a 10-1 Paladin Ford, and Ford actually has more defense than her. Ford is also generally considered to be the worst of the three Cavaliers, and the fact that Amelia takes 20 levels to get to 10-1, whereas Ford takes 4 levels, and therefore this will usually happen at different points from the game from each other, yeah, it's not looking good for Amelia. I could go on, but I think enough ink has been spilled about why Amelia is not especially good, and no, sending her general does not fix that either. Sacred Stones is a game where the classes do not actually affect a unit's growths, it's all their personal growth rates, there are no class growth rates, so sending her into general does not change the fact that she only has a 30% defense growth. If this were a more modern game, and perhaps it added some defense growth, you could make the argument for fast general, I guess. I still don't think it would be good, but as it stands, the only benefit of going general is the promotion bonuses, which is plus two defense. Yeah, don't do it. Ewan joins a little bit too late for my definition of a trainee, but it would feel incomplete not to talk about all three of the Sacred Stones trainees, so I will touch upon him briefly. The fact that he's a mage is definitely a benefit. He can attack enemies who can't counter and hit on resistance. Similar traits to what Lolina has that help with her training arc. He joins much later than her, so it's definitely a more difficult training arc, but Sacred Stone's enemies are lower quality, so it kind of evens out. He also has the option to go Dark Mage and eventually Summoner. This does hurt his weapon ranks, as anything that he's built as a pupil will not carry over into Shaman, but ultimately it is a unique attribute that he shares with only one other unit, Noel. It's for this reason that I actually like him better than both Ross and Amelia, at least in terms of the payoff for the training project. You get something that is relatively unique to him, and pretty useful. Now I do think summoners are overrated to an extent, simply because Sacred Stones is an easy enough game that you don't need their summons, but it is definitely nice to have a disposable unit or extra range for the eggs map. Now, to be clear, because of join time, I think Ross is a better unit, but I prefer Ewan from a design sense because he does have that unique payoff, and the trading arc is not that bad because he can use magic. As far as Tellius is concerned, Rolf, Mist, and Astrid all kind of fall under the trainee umbrella. However, the existence of bonus experience means you can just skip the training arc and get to the point where you have the payoff. Whether that's triangle attack, stabs on a horse, or a good paladin with paragon you can decide which one is best. In general, from a design perspective, I don't like this for trainees, and it's just one of the many reasons why I think bonus experience is a bad design choice, but that is a topic for a future video. Awakening is the game that introduced the aptitude skill, which has sort of become the primary indicator for who is the trainee unit in each game. Donald ends up feeling like a very similar unit to Ross, albeit with a much harder training arc due to being in a much harder game. I do think that ultimately he is a better unit than Ross, simply because if you do bother to go through that training arc, he ends up as a statistically better version of the unit he's replacing, in this case it would be Vake, as a 10-1 fighter Donald is statistically better than Vake in all relevant areas. Donald does, however, suffer from weapon rank issues, he requires a second seal in order to get into a class that is not terrible, and he's going to get skills later than most people, simply due to the fact that he will be a lower level than them. Ultimately, I don't think he's very strong as a unit, but I love him from a design perspective. His female counterpart in Fates, on the other hand, I do think is a pretty good unit, at least in Conquest, but this is mostly because of her class access. 
Her stats are not the greatest in the world, but she can access Archer, which is one of the better class lines in Fates and is a very rare thing in Conquest. Even better, she can pass Archer onto Effie, who is a unit who makes great use of the class line. And she can potentially pass one of these skills such as Quick Draw down to her children. This utility alone I think makes her worth using, and leads me to like her more than the units who are simply balls of stats, but I do think it is worth noting that much like Donald, she costs you a seal, and the seals are in tight competition in Conquest. I also don't like her as much in Revelations or Birthright, simply because you have access to other archers in those games. Cyril from Three Houses is definitely intended to be a trainee, but he really doesn't play like one. Three Houses is probably the game where your stats matter least out of any Fire Emblem, and no unit exemplifies this better on their own than Cyril, who is just as useful in a 0% growth run as he is in a growth run text. Cyril joins in Chapter 5, with just enough time to tutor him up to C plus bows before the map begins and give him point blank folly. This, in combination with some other tools, such as forges or meals, gives him enough kill power to get rid of almost every enemy on the map in one round of combat. This is huge, it is more power than almost every unit you have at the time will do, and honestly is a comparable performance to Catherine, the pre-promote that many consider to be the Jagan of Three Houses. Beyond this, if you tutor his Lance Rank 2C+, he now has access to two kill tools which work pretty good in conjunction with each other. Due to his skill boons, he has easy pathing into just about any physical class you care for, including Wyvern and Bow Knight, some of the more powerful classes in the game. While Cyril is definitely a powerful unit, he doesn't feel like a trainee since there's no training arc. You could argue that the tutoring is a training arc, but it's one that takes place entirely off of the battlefield, and doesn't even take a long time, so it doesn't really feel like one. Don't get me wrong, I love using Cyril, and I think he's pretty cool from a design perspective, I just don't think they designed a particularly good trainee unit. They simply designed a good unit, who occasionally cosplays as a trainee thanks to his personal skill. It is kind of weird that they decided to give him aptitude and then low growths to counter it out, but ultimately I don't think it matters because his growth rates do not matter in the slightest. Speaking of weirdness around aptitude, they redesigned it for Engage and then handed it out to John. Now, I do really like the way that Aptitude works in Engage since it adjusts based on your class growths and therefore theoretically could allow you to specialize in whatever role you want. However, I don't think that in practice it works out the way that it should since you don't get second seals until Chapter 8, which is long after Jean has joined. This, in conjunction with Engage's strange experience system, means that if you want to make him a role that doesn't benefit from the Martial Monk levels, such as Wyvern or General, you have to wait a long time not using him and then second seal him into something else at level 1. Otherwise, there's not really a huge appeal to the aptitude growth boosting. Magic is going to be super useful to you if you go Wyvern. In addition, if you look at Jean's growths with Aptitude active, you'll find that much like Cyril, they nerfed his personal growth in order to make up for the fact that Aptitude will boost the class growths. As such, even hyper-investing into him leads you with just an average combat unit, someone who isn't going to be that much better than the other combat gods you get handed in the mid-game. Granted, his training arc is definitely easier than a lot of other trainees, probably the easiest training arc out there since you can just spam Great Sacrifice with Micaiah, but at the end of the day the payoff is not anything phenomenal, which can also be said for the other trainee in this game, Anna. She is a much more specialized trainee, with magic and speed being her best areas instead of just generalizing, but despite this she is still outclassed throughout the majority of the game. If you choose to go the Mage Knight route, then Pandreo will just be a better version of her for basically every map except for Endgame, and if you choose to keep her in Warrior, she will be very good at using the Radiant Bow, but she won't be super good at using physical bows, and it's also worth noting that the kill thresholds for Endgame Wyverns with the Radiant Bow is either 0 magic or 13 magic, depending on whether or not you have the DLC, and this is not especially hard for even physical units to reach. Don't get it twisted, John and Anna are both incredibly fun units to use, but I don't think either of them is particularly strong, and I don't think the payoff for training them as a trainee is especially worth it. 
And that is kind of the running theme for these trainees and why so many of them don't work. You spend a bunch of time training them and end up with a slightly better or slightly worse version of a unit that you just got for free. Not only does this training arc take effort, but often it takes limited pools of experience away from other units who would benefit from it more. Even easy training arcs, like Anna or Ross, are taking experience away from other units who could really use the levels. Sure, you could Makaya spam with Anna, or you could put it on Chloe. Instead of the payoff just being combat, I think trainees should focus on having some sort of unique utility, such as the Master Knights in FE4 or Summoners in FE8. While it would mean that their strength as unit does somewhat depend on the strength of their unique attributes, it is a better spot to be in than just being another combat unit, especially if the combat is comparable to their peers. That's not to say that combat can never work as a payoff, but it would need to be incredibly strong in comparison to the unit's peers, while also not being overkill. Naren from Tearing Saga comes to mind as a unit who makes the combat payoff work for trainees, but I think it is incredibly rare that this happens, especially in Modern Fire Emblem, where most units tend to be adequately statted. In addition to having a unique payoff, I do think it is important for trainees to have a distinct training arc, otherwise they don't really feel like trainees. Units like Cyril and Mozu are definitely pretty strong, but they don't really feel like trainees because, especially in Cyril's case, you aren't going through that zero to hero. He just starts as a hero and maintains, and that is a much more boring progression than going from wimp to muscle man. So I guess those are my final thoughts about trainees. In general, I would like them to have some sort of unique attribute in addition to combat, and I think that it is important for them to have a training arc, otherwise it's hard to really call them a trainee, regardless of what class they start out in. This is why Leaf and Lachesis are probably my favorite iterations of trainees that Fire Emblem has done, because they just check all of the boxes. Sure, it's not the hardest training arc in the world, especially if you cheese Rastasis' training arc, but it is one that exists, and the payoff is pretty phenomenal. And it also gives you the dopamine feeling of ding 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 when you get all of those stats on level up. But what are your thoughts on this? Are there any trainees that I didn't talk about that you wish I had? Go ahead and let me know in the comments if you think that there's something else that would help trainees stand out in Fire Emblem. And while you're down there, if you wouldn't mind hitting like and subscribe, I would really appreciate it. It helps small channels like me to get eyeballs on our videos. If you're interested in hearing about Ests, then be sure to click on the link to Akira's video as well. Last but not least, I would like to thank my patrons, Marin Karen and Thick Mulder, for sponsoring not only this video, but every video on the channel. And apparently my cats would like to thank y'all too, because two of them just jumped up on my lap, and you might be able to hear them purring into the microphone right now. So thank you uh, from me, Alfresco, and Mercury. And if you are interested in joining the Patreon, the link is in the description. There's a couple of cool benefits down there, and it really helps the channel out. But regardless, have a wonderful day. Take care, gamers.